Hello everyone and welcome to this mini lecture on feminism in popular culture. In this video we're going to take a look at understanding feminist theory and why and how it might be useful in exploring popular culture. So first let's talk about what feminism is. Uh, there's uh, it's gotten a bad rap um, in the last two or three decades a lot of that is kind of a response from uh, typically more conservative enclaves within culture that has attempted to paint feminism as something negative um, but feminist uh, feminism and feminist theory it's basically an approach that attempts uh, to examine the inequalities of sexes believing largely that the difference the differences are culturally and socially constructed uh, that is while there may be some differences between the sex those are much smaller than what we perceive of differences between the sexes and a lot of them have been created through culture and through our in our institutions to make those bigger than they appear so within popular culture one of the things that feminism is very useful in, in, in doing is considering the ways that women are dealt with shaped and represented uh, as well as increasingly looking at how males are as well because there's an increased understanding that you know the the system that we have set up is problematic because it's not just about women but it's also about the ways in which men are misrepresented or purposely forged into being uh, the certain ways that they are expected to be and so that there's this this obviously back and forth relationship that that really needs exploring and better defining for uh, potentially better a better society of, of equality and uh, fairness so there are there's a lot of different feminist theories and theoretical approaches and I think that's the important thing to remember is that feminism is not one single entity or the, the only single piece around feminism is this attempt for there to be equal value between men and women uh, and that's at the core of it but there's different theoretical approaches to exploring and understanding that so we'll take a look at a few but these certainly aren't all of them the first is what would be considered liberal fe feminism and this really looked at and critiqued the unequal representation in media and popular culture uh, so this is things like is there equal amounts of male leads and female leads in films in TV sitcoms in uh, newscasters right and it speaks to this idea of you know if if we are an equal society then equal representation should show up throughout the culture and if not then there's something going on there structurally that's privileging one group over the other radical feminism is typically looking at and, and, and kind of perceives that the culture is purposely structured to present negative images of females to maintain patriarchy and in fact when you start to look at high culture it's typically associated with masculine features and popular culture is typically considered with feminine features so if you think about high culture you think about things that require quote unquote work and things that require you know this this extreme effort and dedication whereas popular culture is light it's to be easily consumed it is not as powerful right so there's a, this view within radical feminism that says you know sh the culture has actually constructed this way purposely and in many ways attempts to depower females and this is where some people get challenged by or get concerned at saying you know well but but you know there's many there's there's most people don't hate females uh, there's that argument that that pops out there and there's a validity to this but of course the idea within radical feminism is that this is deeply seated and it isn't necessarily on the surface but it shows in a variety of ways it shows up in the fact you know if you just look at the disproportion of males to females in terms of sexual violence um, in terms of violence in general um, that this starts to kind of show up systematically and then there's socialist feminism and 
within this, you know, it, this form of feminism pulls upon socialism, and the, the approach is understanding the media construction, the, the media construction situated within other social dynamics such as cl a, uh, class and race. So this is this talks about the idea of feminism or the the representation of females is part of this other dynamic of class and race and is overall an attempt to depower or to limit people and in this case women in particular. All right, so there's also other ways or other th other hypotheses or ways of looking at female representation or looking at feminist uh, ideas within popular culture. One is this idea of the reflection hypothesis, which is the media perpetuates the dominant social values in our culture uh, through what we would call symbolic representation. That is how we want to see ourselves. They do this in part to attract audiences through the lowest common denominator um, of shared values and amusements. So what this says is if we look at culture, um, culture is typically a representation of how we want ourselves to be. And so if we look at a culture and there is very poor representation of women in major media outlets, then that tells us of how we want to be. It's, this is an interesting hypothesis because as we start to see more women and more minority groups, it's telling us that we want to see ourselves better than a male, a, a, t a traditionally white male dominated society. Um, so the fact that this is being broadcast, you know, to quote unquote the lowest common denominator shows that our values are actually changing if you buy into the reflection hypothesis. Then there's also content analysis. This is another way of looking at um, our understanding gender, sex, sexuality, or race and ethnicity in popular culture. And this is extrapolating the actual elements of a piece of media to measure how much of something is represented. So this is this entails, you know, really going out and doing a lot of, uh, one could say, a lot of counting. Um, how many, you know, the question I have up here, how many women are happy and successful in Hollywood movies? So this is really kind of posing a question and looking at whether there is evidence or looking at how much and trying to really see if these things are, you know, what does that suggest about the culture? What would it suggest if you, you know, go out and do a study and find more women are unhappy and successful as bosses in Hollywood movies versus men or you know you find more women as secretaries that are happy and content versus men that are secretaries well that would be an interesting exploration how many men are secretaries or administrative assistants in Hollywood movies um, but the the question that that this comes up of course is does this present a trend uh, does uh, but does presence of a trend constitute a truth that is just because this is a trend this is something that's happening um, does this really work and what I have there's you know ca is this causation or correlation um, and a good example of that or another way of thinking about that is we also see this with violence is that does violence in film correlate or cause violence in the real world. So it's it's an interesting exploration, but it doesn't always give us the answers that we're hoping because we're always looking for causation. Correlation is nice, but causation can actually tell us something about how to fix it. And then we have interpretive analysis, and this is exploring the underlying meanings and ideas not overtly present within a piece of popular culture. Uh, and this is making sense of the subtext, and so you could use semiology and structuralism, and these are things we'll look at later, um, but I've hinted at before in this course where you really are trying to look at what's implicit in the piece of popular culture. What are the, what's, what's being clearly communicated but not directly communicated. So again, if we look at, you know, a good example is of course females' place in sports. Um, in particularly, you know, when you go and you see um, sports games, of course, you know, we start to see privileging of males, right? There's all sorts of money to be found in the NBA and the uh, NFL, but much less when you get to the WNBA or the place of women in these environments, which is often as cheerleaders, not as players.
there's also this interesting concept called the symbolic annihilation of women and this idea really you know it, it talks about the or it's it's this vein of or this this vein of thought that talks about patriarchal a patriarchal culture's attempt to limit or lessen pow the power abilities and agencies of women through limited representation so this is taking that idea and you know that idea of less representation is purposeful in saying this is an attempt to weaken women uh, if you want a really fascinating example of this because I think there there at times this is there's elements of truth to this if you want a fascinating example of this look at the 2008 uh, presidential elections and in particularly during the primaries the ways in which Hillary Clinton is discussed and represented over her male contendants. Um, similarly, when Sarah Palin becomes the vice president uh, candidate for the Republican Party, you see again some very fascinating ways in which women are, 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 are limited, um, the ways in which they're discussed, the ways in which they are Question. You know, they're questioned about things that you never see men being questioned about in politics, about what they're wearing, about how they are as parents. Um, there's some very fascinating things. And, and the argument from a feminist perspective is that's a symbolic annihilation. It's an attempt to weaken the women, to distract the actual conversation about a woman as a leader. We also have this thing called the gaze, and it's one of your readings in this week. Um, it's, it's a concept from Laura Mulvey, and the argument, and it's, you know, there's, there's some discussion about whether it's actually relevant or true or as powerful as it is today, but the argument is largely that within a lot of products of popular culture, men are presented as the lookers, are the people who are looking, viewing, gazing, kind of the active agent in a piece of popular culture. And women are really the object of the gaze. They are meant to be looked at. They are the passive characters. Um, and you see this a lot within, I, I can remember cartoons doing this, or also in film where, you know, the camera will cut to the woman and will pan from you know her legs up to her head and down again and then of course you have a look you know the, the camera switches to the man and all it shows of the man is the man looking at the woman um, and so this talks again about agency and power and privilege within a culture who's expected to be looked at and who gets to look and I think this also we see this particularly in our clothing and the expectations around women and how they are to appear versus men and how they're to appear so let's take a look at a couple interesting examples um, cookbooks are a great example definitely go into any bookstore or, or any library and check out the cookbooks and of course you will find them predominantly covered with women and in fact if they do have a male on the cover I more often than not that male is referred to as a chef but if we look at cookbook covers you know here we see of course women predominantly and we see women in servient roles they're either like in the bottom corner the the home helps you know right there willing to serve you food or they're well dressed like in the French cookbook you know who if you're cooking in the kitchen who's gonna get all dressed up like that or, or why would you get dressed up like that they could be maternal uh, as we see in the tested Crisco recipes um, you know, there, there's lots of different ways in which they are presented, but they, this is a very interesting thing in which they are overall present, you know, you typically see women in cookbooks. And so what does that tell us about our culture? What does that tell us about the role of women and their, you know, their level of agency and power? But then, of course, we also get into looking at magazine and comic book covers. And here we see, well, women are in need of rescuing, right? Many of these, they are, they are in danger um, in, of one sort or another. They are often, you know, being restrained. We've got several here where the women are tied up and therefore in need of, you know, being protected. They are also scantily clad, so there are sex symbols. They are there for pleasure. Um, Again, if you contrast what males get to wear and what females get to wear, it's, it's fascinating. If you look at the rocket, rocket to the moon, right? So you have a woman who, of course, can wear um, a very, very minimum clothing, but the male has to have a helmet on and a full spacesuit. Uh, you find this, you know, covered throughout. 
So it gives us again another example or another way of looking at it and thinking about representation and what does that tell us about culture. I mean when you look at these covers it's overwhelmingly the idea that the woman is victim, right? How many times is she tied up? How many times does she need, is she clearly in danger? Alright, so hopefully this has given you some introductory ideas into the ideas around feminist, uh, feminism, feminist approach, and I hope that you can bring these into the course um, as we talk about different things. So thank you very much for watching, and see you in the next video.